I select pretty quick. It needs to be fat and even. Now the fatter the better, it's going to go through your mill, and if it's even, it means it's all going to get crushed evenly. Uh, if it's not even, and you've got bits going through and crushed and all the rest of it, you're just losing the out on extract and you're wasting money. And of course, it wants to smell lovely and, and sweet and fresh. One of the things as a home brewer to see if it's good quality malt is if you grab, especially with your base malts, you grab a corn, you should be able to break it in half with your fingernail, and that's telling you that it's nice, friable malt. It's been well modified. If you can't break it in half with your fingernail, then it probably means that it hasn't been uh, modified properly. Another wee trick that you can do is you can put it in a glass of water and the majority of it should float. So this is the base malts I'm talking about. Uh, your, your crystal malts and some of your roasted malts will, will act differently because they have a different uh, process of going through. But for example, your pills are an aisle. If you put it in water, the majority of corns should float up straight away. If you leave it there for long enough, of course, that will float up sick. Those are some of the things as a, as a home brewer, when you look at your malts, you can tell whether they're good quality. And you should be doing this all the time. And if it's not what you think it should be, you need to talk to your distributor or who you're getting it from. And if you, enough people complain about something, then they uh, will make a change. But if nobody says anything, well, nothing's going to happen. And after a while, you'll get good at it. And, and I know some of you guys here have been doing a lot of home brewing over the years. And you know straight away when you open the bag, this stuff pretty average, whatever. And what happens? You put up with it. Now you shouldn't do that. Now, you pay money, good money for it. You know, I always say, squeaky wheel gets the most oil. Okay. And obviously, grab a good hand for what and taste. Don't just taste one corn. Sometimes you know you might just brush your teeth or some damn thing, and you're not, you're not going to get the right. You know, you're, it's going to give you a bit of a different taste. Grab a good handful, chew it up, and really work out what that flavour is of what you want. So if we can go here. So typical craft malt specifications versus mainstream malt. Now I touched on this a little bit before. When I talk about mainstream malt, that's malt that's made by some of the larger malting companies for the likes of your Budweiser and your Heineken Specs. Now those type of malts are made out of a higher protein value because they're after a high diastatic level. The reason why they want a high diastatic level, now diastatic is just basically the measurement of how active the enzymes are in that malt and how they're going to be able to convert the, uh, the sugars into, uh, into fermentable sugars and what have you. So the mainstream malts are going to be high diastatic power because they're also adding in a lot of unmalted adjuncts such as rice and what have you. But you're a craft brewer, so you know, it's all malt brewing. So you don't need to have a really high diastatic uh, malt. So don't get put off when you look at a malt spec and you say, oh, hang on, it's not up around um, 350 like this other model. You, know, you don't need it up there. Fan is another classic one as well. Now, as the protein level goes up in the barley when you, as you, in the mop, in, you bring it into the malt pit, it's going to give you higher fan levels. Now again, because you're all malt brewing, you don't need to have fan levels up around 180, 200. Okay? Because if you start having high fan levels, you will have detrimental effects to the finished beer at the other end. Okay? You'll end up with some off flavours coming through and bottled beer if it's stored for too long. It also has other detrimental effects to the, the way the hops flavours come through. So we try to aim for a fan of around about 120 to 140 for our craft malts because we feel that is about where what you need. Of course, if your fan levels are below that level, then you are going to have issues with fermentation. And one of the things sometimes we do get from some customers is they say, hey, we're having issues with fermentation. You've got to remember as, as a brewer, whether you're a home brewer or a craft brewer, is yeast nutrition is really, really important. Okay, the malt's there to feed the yeast. It's giving it you know, the soluble nitrogen not having to feed it. But you also need to make sure you're oxygenating that food. comes in really handy mm. and probably, I don't know even at the home brew level, I think it's probably some kind of good idea if you were to go into that to try to make that perfect beer, but you'd be amazed how many craft because don't actually know the microscope. Oh, pH reader? 
here or pH, for example. Like the coal bar index again. A very sexy pH man. It's up to uh, you know the level that you want to go to, but I mean all these things cost money, and you've got to juggle it out. So well, what is it that we're trying to achieve as, as a home brewer? Or maybe you know it's just about having a bit of fun. But if you want to take it to the next level, then those are some of the things that you need to, to juggle. The Kohlbach index again for a craft malt shouldn't be too high. If it's too high up around that 44 to 46, 47, it means that you've chopped up those protein chains too much. Okay? And that beer is going to be thin bodied and it's probably not going to have the head retention that you're looking for. So we try at Gladfield, we try to keep our, our protein modification down around 37 to 40 give you a nice body to the beer and we understand that you're not going to be adding all these adjuncts. But if you drop that coal bark index much lower down to about 34, 35, then you haven't chopped the proteins up. Now, does any, I, I, I'm just taking it for granted, everybody understands what I mean by coal bark, coal bark index. Basically what it is, is when we measure we take the solution, we're measuring the ratio of soluble nitrogen versus total nitrogen. And we just divide the two figures. So if you've got a lot of soluble nitrogen in there, then you hold, that means that you've had a lot more protein modification coming through in the solution. So therefore your coal bark index is higher. So basically it means that you've had a lot more protein modification. But like I'm saying, if you've got too much protein modification, if you're trying to make a craft beer or you want that nice body and head and you're trying lots of hops and everything else in it, you don't want to have that way up around the, uh, 45 to 47 like you would for a mainstream malt that you'd expect if you're making something like Budweiser. Okay? So you've got to be careful when you're buying the malts that you don't end up with a Budweiser spec if you're trying to make a nice, like a Dunkel beer or something like that, I don't know. You know? It, it's just really important that you keep those uh, ideas in your head. Now, friability is a measure of how easy it is to crush that malt. And what it generally means, if you've got a high friability malt, it means that it's well modified. Now, this is where it gets confusing, because we're saying, well, we're trying to keep it coal bark and modification around there, we got it too high, but I'm just saying now, friability, you've got high, good modification. There's two types of modification when you're making the malt, and this is where it comes back to the 